Okay, we're going to go over chapter one and two of Carry On Mr. Bowditch. The setting and the characterizations are the first things that a book will usually talk about. So first we're going to just see what the setting is. And right now we're simply going to say it was, um, the main setting is Salem, Massachusetts. It's a port city, meaning lots of boats coming and going, lots of the jobs revolving around um, sailing. Um, they were in a different part of Massachusetts, Danvers, I believe, at the beginning, but they immediately moved. They're a poor family. It's the Revolutionary War. Um, and so we've got an interesting, you know, and, and they're moving to try to kind of get a new start to things. Also, we're going to talk about the characterization, and we're going to start with our protagonist. Nat Bowditch is our protagonist. Um, and it starts out, he is just six years old, and he's laying in bed, and he's thinking about, um, you know, f trying to help his family out of this bad situation. He's found a little coin, and he's going to try to do something to create good luck. So he's a, he's a good kid, you know, got good intentions. Um, and then later in the story, we notice that he asks his father for advice with what to do with the coin. He follows his father's advice and he invests it um, with all the money that he had. And um, so, you know, he's going to be a neat little character. We can, we can already sort of see a little bit of the plot here of Nat trying, even as a young child, to help his family out of a bad situation. Liza is a sister of his, and she is eight years old, and she's closest in age to Nat, but more than that, that is his friend. You know, when he has a secret, he's going to tell her. He knows she won't tell anybody else, and, and this is the person he is closest to. We're also introduced to Granny in the beginning of this story, and... Hold on a second, sorry. And we see that Granny is very worried about everything. She doesn't want anybody going on the sea. She's worried about their situation. She's even worried about her son going into town, that maybe that would be a bad thing. And so she seems a little bit, um, she's worried about that Nat's not eating. I mean, you know, almost just um, filled with anxiety and maybe even a bit inactive or not sure what to do about that. Feels kind of overcome and powerless maybe is a good way to describe her. We're going to also talk about Nat's father and um, just basically, you know, he used to be a sea captain and four years ago there was a storm and his ship was totally broken up. And I think that that's almost symbolic of how his life is now. It broke up with the ship. Um, he even was depressed and turned to some sinful things like drinking for a while. Um, but he's trying to do a fresh start. He's going to move his family back to Salem. And they're going to try a new thing. He's going to become a cooper. Um, he's not excited about that. You see him kind of saying to a former sail sail you know guy that sails with them and stuff that you know yeah you know it's just safer it's nicer but he he definitely doesn't say you know he's real excited about it um before we talk about some other things I just want to go over a little bit about how the author did this characterization we have talked in the past about direct and indirect characterization and good books and good writers use more indirect um, for instance, if I was going to tell you the characterization of this book in a way that's not so fun, I could just say to you, in the story there is a father who's depressed trying to start over. Um, there's a boy who's six and thinks he can help. There's, you know, but that's no, not so much fun. So I want you to remember when you characterize, when you're writing, to make sure that you're letting the reader discover the character of your story through what they do, what they say, what other people say about them. This is all indirect characterization. And it makes the reader feel a part of what's going on. And I think that our author here, um, Jean Latham, did a good job of that. Okay. Now we're going to go on and we're going to talk. So every time we talk about the symptoms in our thing, we also... I just added this slide so you can kind of see them all together. 
And then if I can get it to go to the next one. Okay. Oh, before we talk about theme, I want to talk about one literary device that was in our second chapter, I believe, and it's an allusion. Allusion is where a book will refer to another very famous thing in literature or in life or different things. And there was one in our story, and it was to Jonah from the Old Testament in our scriptures. And it was a father saying, you wouldn't want me on your ship. I'm a Jonah. I'd bring bad luck. And um, illusion is a great technique to help people really visualize and um, know, you know, kind of exactly what somebody is saying. This one, this illusion is very stated because it is written for, um, you know, boys your age. As an adult book, he probably would have just said, you wouldn't want a Jonah like me on your ship. And they would expect you to be literate enough to know that means... Oh, just like Jonah of the Bible, who, when he was on the ship, caused storms to happen. And so, once again, you have the father uh, <laughs> dwelling on or reminiscing on that, you know, he had a, sh you know, a shipwreck happen to him. Okay? But back to characterization, the father, indirectly characterized by others, that didn't seem like he was, per se, you know, some sort of bad, you know, captain or did something wrong. Everybody said, oh, that happens to a lot of people was what the other sailor said. So other people didn't see his problems as because he was a bad sailor. And in fact, they seemed to like him um, when um, Nat is trying to buy one of these, well, I don't remember what they're called, but one of these little investments from one of the sailors. Basically, the sailor gave him, said, I'll give you 10% of whatever I earn for, you know, in essence, a nickel because he liked his father. Okay, now we're going to talk about themes. And there's a couple that I want to mention from these two chapters. I thought page 8 had a good theme. It says um, Nat was talking about some different things and didn't want to worry his sister. Remember that he's real close to. And he said his father had always taught him not to take care of, to take care of women and children and not to worry them and things. And so you're, you, you're going to have a theme that's going to be kind of, you know, brought out there. Um, another theme that I noticed is hoping and wishing things will change um, doesn't make them change, okay? So we have the beginning example of Nat's got a silver coin and it's a new moon and he's hoping this will do something. And as an older reader, you're like, oh, come on, you know. And I think that that's sort of a real literal way of, of the author. Remember, a theme is really the author teaching you something or exploring an idea through what he or she is writing. And so I think that's sort of where the author is trying to get you to explore that. You know, do you, what happens when we wish for something really hard? Okay. The next thing is just some different things on those themes to talk about with your parents and that we could talk about in book club. I, I thought it was interesting to think about, is praying real hard for things to change? Is that similar to hoping real hard, or is that different? And if so, how is it different? Okay. Um, is it different because it's not just hoping that, you know, that you're praying for to a real God that is able to change things? Is it different because your posture is becoming one of humility and dependence on an omnipotent God? Is it, um, is it the same? Is it just, you know, you're hoping and thinking and dwelling on things? Or maybe sometimes when we say we're praying about things, are we really mm, maybe tricking ourselves and really just hoping and not really praying like we're praying to an omnipotent God. I think it's a really good thing to think about. So um, read through this slide and, and ask these questions with your family. Um, and there's one more thing that I was going to do to kind of farther this discussion. I think to, if I can get the slide to change, sorry guys. Okay. I think one way to do it would be to just get a sheet of paper and make two columns. On one of them, put pray and wait. On the other, put pray and do in the Lord's strength. And this is, and then you're going to just think of different examples from your life and, and what you think would be the right thing to do. And I want you to basically 
deduce from your examples maybe what the big picture is. Is everything, should we always just pray and wait on the Lord? Or is everything we need to pray and do something? Or do some things fit in one category and some things fit in another category? And what makes the difference? What's the big picture of why you put some in some category and some in another? Um, I also want to make sure you think of biblical examples and what did the people that lived in those times and what did God you know, say about their choices in praying and wishing and hoping and doing and you know not doing and things so um that is all for chapter one and chapter two